Well, 1 Kings chapter 13, we get a really interesting story in uh, this one that we have some, some fun lessons to learn uh, about prophecy and uh, understanding true prophecy. So some really interesting things we get to discuss. Now, in this one, Jeroboam, of course, he is the ruler of Israel. So remember, is the nation of Israel has split, okay? So we have the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, okay? So Judah and Benjamin are basically right around Jerusalem area. Israel is everything else around them, basically. Uh, so we have the two kingdoms, basically. So Jeroboam is, is the king of Israel everywhere else except for Jerusalem area, Judah and Benjamin. Uh, he is smitten and healed from a prophet. Uh, he delivers, the prophet delivers his message, but uh, ends up uh, being punished for some wickedness. So we're going to see some interesting lessons today. Verse 1, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. Uh, remember, Bethel is where one of the altars are, basically. So we're, we're hearing here that, uh, uh, so this is a prophet, a man of God. So somebody who is following God, who's getting revelations from God. He is from the tribe of Judah, and he is, he's coming out from Jerusalem. Basically, he's, he's out of Judah, and uh, God is inspiring him, giving him continuing revelation to go talk to Jeroboam, basically. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So Jeroboam's at Bethel burning incense. He is, uh, these are, remember, Jeroboam set up his own altars in the high places, on the, the hillsides, basically around hill, the hill, top of the hills, excuse me, not sides, uh, around Jerusalem, so that the people wouldn't have to go into Jerusalem to Solomon's temple to worship. He's built his own altars so they can worship outside, which is idolatry. Uh, verse two, and then this is the, the man of God that came out of Judah, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. So this is a revelation, basically, of a man named Josiah who will come from uh, the house of David, so part of that descendancy of King David, who will basically destroy the these altars and uh, get rid of the, this false religion. Verse 3, And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. So remember, the altars usually were a, kind of a box container, and there's a little fire inside that box where you'd burn incense, you'd burn the sacrifices and things, and there's a horn on each corner. So the altar would split, and all the ashes that are inside there would fall out, basically. Verse 4, It came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. So you have to realize, Jeroboam has set up a parallel religion, basically, to encourage Israel to not go to the temple in Jerusalem, so he's, he's created an, a more idolatrous religion and gone away from the true religion. He set up a fake religion, a, a parallel religion, basically, so that he could maintain power over the people. It wasn't about following the truth and righteousness. It's about power. He wanted power over the people. And so this is, that's what he has done. So he is, this prophet comes out of Judah, which is, he sees somewhat of it as his enemy, comes out of Judah and says, hey, Look, your religion is wrong, it's false, God is going to destroy it and get rid of it. So this is kind of a threat against him. And so he, he, he gets up, basically, and he tells the people that are with him, lay hold on him. Now, the rest of verse 4 is interesting. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. So the hand that Jeroboam uses to point at this prophet and says, hey, go, go, Arrest him, basically. Lay hold on him. Capture him. His hand withers, basically, and he, he can't move it. He can't do anything with it. Uh, this has got to be very disconcerting for Jeroboam to go, holy crap, what just happened? My hand is all withered and, and gone now. Verse 5, the altar also was rent. So the altar breaks. It falls apart. 
and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So there was an actual sign that was given to show Jeroboam that this prophet is true and that Jeroboam's false religion is a false religion. It's not a true religion. There's literal signs here to show this to Jeroboam. Hopefully Jeroboam picks up on this, but I doubt it. So let's move on to verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. So, the king's upset. His, his uh, fake religion, his little Potemkin village of ruling, you know, this, ability, this, this mirage of holding on to power is going to crumble and fall apart. And Jeroboam's upset that it's being exposed, but he can't argue with the real power of God here. So he pray, he asked this guy, he knows, Jeroboam knows who God is. Jeroboam knows where the real religion is, but he wants power. And so he doesn't want to let the people be a part of the main religion because that would destroy his power. So he has to talk to this prophet and go, hey, will you ask God, you know, to bless my hand? He's not asking the altar to bless him. He's not asking God through his old religion to bless him. He's asking the prophet from Judah to ask God to bless him. And God does, and he, he gets his hand healed, basically. So, I mean, this really should be a sign to him. Hey, look, dude, you really understand. You may not consciously be willing to admit it, but you understand where God really is. Uh, but he doesn't, unfortunately. Now, verse 7, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So verse 9 is giving us a little bit of historical background on this. So when God called this prophet to go to Bethel, and to say these things while Jeroboam was there, he was told, hey, when you deliver the message, you come back. When you're on your way back to town, basically, go a different way than the way you went, and you are not allowed to eat or drink. You're kind of in a fast situation. You don't eat or drink until you return, basically. And so verse 9 tells us that we didn't hear this at the beginning of the chapter, but we now hear it at this point that that was part of the message that God gave to this prophet was, you don't eat or drink, and you come back in a different way, basically, for, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest, basically. So the way you get there, you're coming back in a different route, and you're not eating or drinking at all, basically. You're fasting the whole time. And then after you get back, then your, your mission, this little mission you're on, your assignment, will be done. So he's saying, basically, I'm not going with the king. I'm not going to eat. I, I, don't, I don't even care if you give me half the kingdom which is saying basically a lot of giving me a tremendous amount of power uh, and wealth. It's, it's not what God wants me to do. So verse 10, so he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. So he's keeping this commandment from God, basically. Now verse 11, now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The works which he had spoken unto the king, them they also told to their father. So there is a prophet in Bethel. Now he's out in Israel, of course, not from Judah. And so he is being, he his sons basically, which are most likely, could be literally his sons, but probably other priests, uh, lesser priests basically, that uh, are there because these are people that are, most likely, if they're out here in Bethel, they're ministering. These are the priests that Jeroboam has called, most likely have called to be uh, the priests in this false religion. I, we could be wrong. This, this prophet, this is an old prophet. So this could be not so much he is one of the priests in Jeroboam's religion, but he is a, uh, a former priest, basically, that uh, from the tribe of Levi or Aaron, uh, the sons of Aaron or something like that, that is living in Israel. 
in the kingdom of Israel, basically, not in the kingdom of Judah. But because Israel has gone away from the true religion that he's kind of not used or, or utilized a lot, basically. Um, so there could be, there's more to that part there. It'd be interesting to, to learn some of that background. Uh, verse 12, And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. So these two prophets are meeting, basically. Verse 15, He said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. So this old prophet is trying to get him to come home with him, basically to rest, to hang out. Well, this guy, of course, is this newer prophet is saying from Judah, saying, that's, I can't. God has told me not to, basically. So verse 18, he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. So he's establishing that connection between them. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drink water. Now here's the challenge with this. Okay, There's a couple questions I think that most people are going to bring up at this point. It sounds like there's a prophet and he delivered a message and it was going back. And another prophet said, hey, there's another message for you that I should be bringing. So I think this kind of this will cause confusion for a lot of people to ask which prophet is true. Is there one prophet that's true? Could they both be true? What's going on with this? Uh, and this is, I think, part of the challenge of this chapter is understanding this. So let's let's kind of pull this apart a little bit. Is it true that God could reveal things to more than one person? Yes, it is true that he could reveal things to more than one person or reveal different things to different people and they could come together to collaborate on that. Um, is it true that God would contradict himself? No, he doesn't contradict himself. So this is, I think this is a good opportunity for us to talk about, so what really, how do we know who's right, who's wrong, where really truth exists? Okay, God loves order and, and patterns in what he does. And so we can utilize what we've learned in the past to help us understand things now. He builds a framework for us, basically. That's, a big part of the scriptures is to help us understand that framework of living the gospel in our life. So in this instance, when we look at this story here and see this, we have two people that claim to be prophets of God that both got a revelation. Uh, but now, here's the thing is it almost sounds like con there's a contradiction between these. Now in verse 18, it ends with, and he lied to him. So it could say, if we take this literally, it's saying that this old prophet basically lied to the new prophet said, oh no, I got a revelation for you. Come be with me. Okay. And that contradiction would be a lie because he lied to him. So if we take the story at face value, it looks like this prophet lied to this prophet to convince him to be disobedient, basically. Claiming, oh no, I had authority. God gave me a revelation that, that you don't need to do that anymore, that you need to come this way. So here's something that's important for us to understand, okay? When God gives us revelation, there's two important things to understand. One is he doesn't contradict himself, ever. He doesn't, okay? It's, it's man's interpretation is where contradictions come in. He doesn't contradict himself. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Very, very important thing to always understand. The second thing to understand is there is no revelation given that won't be confirmed by the Holy Ghost. So anytime somebody tells you something, you can confirm it through the Holy Ghost. The whole point of Moroni 10, 3 through 5, that famous set of scriptures that all missionaries memorize and learn and, and use to tell people you need to read the Book of Mormon and then pray about it, that is not just about understanding the Book of Mormon. That is about understanding all truth. Okay, Nephi does this when his father has his grand vision. 
he, he talks to his brothers, hey brothers, what do you think about this grand vision my, our dad had? And they say, we don't understand it because God doesn't tell us the, the explanation. He's, he, we're waiting for him to tell, explain it to us and he's not telling us anything. So we're going to blame God for our laziness. And Nephi's like, that's not right. You don't, that's not what you do. You need to seek the Spirit yourself and understand it. And this is important. There is no revelations that God gives us that anybody can't have a, have a testimony or witness of. And we absolutely should be seeking our own witness of what our leaders are telling us. The Spirit should back it up. So the more we understand the Spirit and how to feel that Spirit and be aware of it, the more we can discern truth from error or things, okay? The Spirit will guide us in those matters. So it would have been, it would have been important for this prophet to pray and say, is this true, God? Did you send him a different revelation than me? Okay, now, and this brings up a point. If God tells you something, he'll tell you if it changes. Okay, this sometimes happens where people just go, Oh, I got this revelation, and it's totally against everything the church is talking about. Or it's, you know, the church is going this way, and suddenly I get this revelation, the church needs to go this way. That's not how God works, okay, at all. We can always pray and see which way is the true path, and he will always go through whoever he revealed this truth to, to go down this path, he will keep revealing the truth to them to change course if they need to. So this is super important for us to understand, all right? Seeking truth is something we have to do individually, and it's important that we take the time to do so. All right, very, very important point. Now, if you have read this chapter, if you're familiar with this chapter, you're following the footnotes, you're probably sitting there going, but Gertus, wait, 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 you keep talking about this stuff, but verse 18 is wrong. And that is correct. Joseph Smith corrects verse 18. It's, verse 18 is not correct, and it changes how this story goes. So let's look at the Joseph Smith translation in, in footnote 18b. So right now it reads that this prophet tells him, oh no, God told me to come get you and bring you back and let you eat. And it tells us that that was a lie. This guy, this old prophet was lying to the newer prophet. But in Joseph Smith's translation, he says, drink water that I may prove him, and he lied not unto him. So... What this is telling us is that this old prophet did get a revelation from God to bring him back to test this young man to see if he will keep the commandments or not, basically. And this prophet told him all of this. He was truthful. I am here to bring you back and to test you to see if you're going to actually keep the commandments or not. So he understood this, basically. So th there's a whole different emphasis in there. So this is another revelation that is out there basically, but it's a, to test this person. So it's important to understand that God can inspire people for different things. And then when we come together, we have that opportunity to work together or clash. So sometimes this happens. Uh, I think this happens uh, more frequently probably in a leadership position between a president and their counselors or other things like that. But it's important to realize there's still an established understanding of, of who gets revelation. Okay, and how that works. That does not mean that if you are the president of an organization that no one else can have revelation for that organization. Because sometimes other people might be inspired in certain ways that maybe you wouldn't have been open to because of their unique experiences in their life. So that's where councils make such a difference. Collective revelation coming together is very, very important. So understand, okay, that this prophet was told to ask this prophet to do this, to, tr to test this prophet, basically, is what it was. So that's what happened. So verse 19, oh, we read that. First night he went back with him, did eat in his house and drink water. So this is the problem, is the old prophet was used to test the new prophet to see if he'll keep the commandments, and the new prophet broke those commandments, the younger one. He broke the commandments, basically. He didn't, but he, he held good with the king, but he didn't hold up with this other prophet, basically. Verse 20, And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. So this is the older prophet. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place, 
of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, for thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. That's the problem here, okay? Is this is, he broke the commandment. This, te this prophet was to go to test him. Maybe this prophet didn't realize he was there to test him, but this guy eventually said, no, I'm going to go with you. So, again, seek the Spirit. Seek the guidance of the Spirit to help you know, because if this new prophet he even had said, oh, you received this revelation to come talk to me and bring me back, okay, but that doesn't supersede what I was already given. And so, as we seek the Spirit, the Spirit would have confirmed, yes, you can go back with this guy to talk with him, but you're not allowed to stay, and you're not allowed to eat. So there's a, you have to have that confirmation. And go always go back to the Spirit to help you understand. If things sound contradictory, you seek the guidance of the Spirit to help you out. Very important point. Great, great lesson we get to learn in here. So verse 23, And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he settled for him the ass, to wit, for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. So this young prophet was killed by a lion, basically, that God, that God was punishing him, is what they're trying to tell us here. Uh, verse 25, And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass, carcass east in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they, they came and told in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass, and they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. And the lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. He laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So they're sad that he died. He had such a harsh punishment for disobeying God. Um, but that's what he's saying has happened, basically. Now, verse 31, It came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulchre wherein the man of God is buried, lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. So he agreed that this prophecy that he gave to Jeroboam that this the false religion would fall apart. He's like, yes, this is going to happen. This is going to this is going to happen. So verse 33, after this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places. Whosoever would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the high priests of the high places. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. So Jeroboam was warned that his plan to hold power would fall apart, and he decided to stay with it. He loved his power more than he loved God. And so he stayed with it. He, he reinforced the this false religion, basically. And uh, so this is a big problem that Jeroboam is facing. The biggest challenge of his life probably is, do I do what I want to do, or do I do what God wants done? A big problem that happens. And a big challenge that happens, even in the life of that young prophet, he does what God says, but then he kind of does what he wants to do, and he loses because of it. That's probably a little more symbolic to Jeroboam of, if you disobey God, consequences will follow. It's probably more of the greater message that God's trying to get over to uh, Jeroboam by the experiences that this young prophet had. So, uh, really interesting lessons we get to learn. I'd love to hear in the comments, what do you think about this story and what's happening at this point in time for Israel? Uh, and I, we, I mean, we can look back historically, and we have 2020 vision of what happened to them. Uh, but imagine what it'd be like to live at this time, and have these competing factions going back and forth, both claiming we are the true religion, we are the true power in government. Which one is it? How would that feel? That would be pretty interesting. So I look forward to reading your comments uh, on this as well. As we're going to continue to jump into the next chapter.